Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet podcast. My name is Georgia Ray, and I am your regular host. Today, we are bringing you an episode from the Enforcement Angle series, a partnership between the Environmental Law Institute and Sidley Austin LLP. This episode is the official launch of the third season of the Enforcement Angle series. Through the year-long series, our goal is to discuss state and federal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations with senior enforcement officials and thought leaders on environmental enforcement in the United States and globally. The host of the series is Justin Savage. Justin is a partner and the global co-leader of the environmental practice at Sidley Austin, LLP. On today's episode, Justin speaks with Secretary James Kenney and Doug Parker. Secretary Kenney was nominated by Governor Lujan Grisham and unanimously confirmed by the New Mexico Senate to lead the New Mexico Environment Department in January of 2019. The mission of the New Mexico Environment Department is to protect the public health and environment for all New Mexicans. Through his leadership, Secretary Kinney instituted the core values of science, innovation, collaboration, and compliance to guide the department in executing its mission. As a member of the governor's cabinet, Secretary Kinney oversees a department of about 550 employees across 27 offices with an annual agency budget of approximately $100 million per year. The New Mexico Environment Department regulates air and water quality programs, solid and hazardous waste programs, OSHA, restaurant and food manufacturing programs, cannabis and hemp edibles, and more. Prior to his appointment as Cabinet Secretary in January 2019, Kenny spent more than 21 years across two stints at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, most recently as Senior Policy Advisor for Oil and Gas. He worked with senior agency leadership and designed strategies to support environmentally responsible development of oil and natural gas resources. On regulatory and policy matters, he worked alongside states, tribes, federal agencies, NGOs, and industry. Kenny has also served as an environmental engineer at the EPA, leading both civil and criminal investigations related to the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. He has developed strategic compliance and enforcement efforts related to oil and natural gas exploration. In addition, he served as the Acting Associate Director of the U.S. EPA's External Civil Rights Program, ensuring recipients of federal funds comply with the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Finally, he worked as a senior environmental engineer at Denver-based environmental engineering firm McCoy & Associates and as a consultant at the U.S. Department of Justice. Kenny holds both a bachelor's and master's degree in environmental engineering from Temple University. Doug Parker is the CEO and co-founder of Ecolumix, a data intelligence company providing best-in-class environmental performance data and advisory services to the ESG sector. He brings unique insights to his Ecolumix role, having previously served as an environmental risk advisor to large companies and as the director of the EPA's Criminal Investigation Division. He was a special agent in that division for 24 years. As director of EPA's criminal program, he oversaw myriad matters, including the Deepwater Horizon disaster investigation, the Volkswagen emissions cheating investigation, agency efforts to analyze massive amounts of compliance data, and major criminal enforcement initiatives with the Department of Justice. He received his BA from Colby College and MA from Georgetown University. I will now turn it over to Justin. Thank you all for joining us today. All right. Well, thank you, Georgia, for the introduction. And I guess I'll start off with Secretary Kenny and Doug. How are you both doing today? Doing great. Thank you. Doing great as well. Thanks, Justin. And starting with you, Secretary Kenny, why don't you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, your background at EPA, and what you do as the Secretary of the New Mexico Environment Department. Excellent. Yeah. And again, thanks for having me on the podcast. A little bit about my background is I'm an engineer by education, spent 20 plus years at EPA in a number of different offices around the country, mostly focused on 
civil and criminal enforcement as a common denominator between my time at EPA. And in that capacity, have probably crawled around many of the nation's chemical plants and refineries and other places that not many people get to see and have that background as applying from, as an engineer, applying that, those concepts into the way federal and state laws interact with those facilities. But in terms of my role here as the secretary of the New Mexico Environment Department, oversee your traditional air, water, and waste programs, as well as things like OSHA and other programs related to public health in the state of New Mexico. So, and have been here since 2015, I relocated to New Mexico as the oil and gas advisor to then administrator of EPA and was decided that it was a good move for the oil and gas advisor to be in an oil and gas state. So I was here about four years before my appointment to the cabinet under Governor Lujan Grisham. Yeah, thanks so much, Secretary. And then Doug, You've appeared on this podcast before, so we're familiar with your character, and we're not going to draw any negative inferences for Secretary Kennedy, given that you know him, but just briefly a little bit about your background. Thanks, Justin. It's good to be on with you and Secretary Kenny, who's a former colleague at the EPA. I spent a good bit of time, 26 years at, at the EPA in their criminal investigation division, primarily as a special agent, uh, field manager, and later the director of the criminal investigation division where I got to work closely with Secretary Kenny and his colleagues in the civil enforcement side of the house. I left the EPA, retired in 2016, and I'm now in the early stage company space. I have a startup called Ecolumix, which I co-founded, that measures corporate environmental performance and helps advise companies on the best practices and strategies in the ESG and EHS space. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks, Doug. And Secretary Kenny, before we begin, I shared a little bit how New Mexico is close to my heart since I met my wife there. I'm a huge fan of Allsup's Burritos, and it's just a beautiful, beautiful state. But apart from my love of the state, what do you personally have as goals in your role, Secretary, to advance for the land of enchantment? Thanks, Justin. New Mexico is often referred to as the land of enchantment. And as you probably know now from your history and dealings with New Mexico, it's also the land of entrapment in that once you come here and see it, you are smitten with it and ultimately wind up here. And that's, again, how I've gotten here. But in terms of my goals as cabinet secretary for this department, I could take the traditional approach of saying air, water, waste, and kind of giving you some prerogatives around there. And I feel like that's kind of picking which child is your favorite. And I think really what I would say is our core values, the way we implement our mission around science, innovation, collaboration, and compliance are really what the legacy I hope to leave for this department, empowering the public servants who work here to make decisions around our mission using those core values and being definitive in that ability to implement the mission. So if we're focused on protecting ephemeral streams and thinking about how WOTUS would interact with that, Waters of the U.S., We want to use science and collaboration around that. And if we're going to look at climate change, we want to race to the top in terms of attracting the companies that are going to have low carbon footprints in the state. So I'm of the mindset that our core values in implementing our mission do not create any kind of mutual exclusivity between having protected environment and public health and a thriving economy. And I think that's the direction that we've been taking this department, or I've been taking this department, and... The response has been phenomenal from a global investment to a U.S. investment, and that race to the top is clearly on in New Mexico. Thanks, Secretary Kenny. Doug, any comment, having led a major component of EPA, other than to praise your friend, Jim, but any other thoughts? (laughs) Well, I, I will praise my friend, Secretary Kenny, who I've known as Jim for many years. New Mexico, honestly, couldn't be in better hands in terms of leadership. And I say that with, you know, that that's a heartfelt sentiment. I think that being able to build an effective environmental compliance and protection program that's aligned with economic development is critical. That's what he's focused on. And then from my perspective, I work now with, I'm no longer on the enforcement side, I'm on the compliance and risk side and the innovation side. And I think that's where much of the action is in today's sustainability and environmental compliance world. It's finding new ways to improve, innovate, and frankly, out-innovate our competitors at a national level throughout the world. Well said, Doug. And this is the Enforcement Angle podcast, so we should turn to that. And I guess, going back to you, Secretary Kenny, 
What do you see as the main areas of focus for policy development regarding civil and criminal environmental enforcement? And really, how do they relate back to some of the goals you mentioned of having a data-driven, a science-driven organization? It's a great question. And a lot of my thinking around enforcement has been shaped by working with minds like Doug on this podcast and others at EPA and spending a lot of time working with states across the country for decades, actually. But in terms of policy development and how do you advance that civil and criminal enforcement, I think from day one, I've come into this job and said, for any company that is permitted or licensed by the Environment Department, if you go above and beyond what those minimum requirements are, we want to celebrate you and we want to hold you up as the example by which others should strive to be. And then there are those who just comply and there's no judgment there. If the best they can do is comply with the permit they have, that's great. And we appreciate that as well. For those who fall below that bar of compliance, for whatever reason, those are the ones that we need to return to compliance first and foremost. And those are the ones that we need to hold accountable. Because when that does happen, there is that unlevel playing field that happens, right? And I can think of my days as an inspector back at EPA crawling around a chemical plant in Delaware where one of the environmental managers said to me, the best thing you could do is cite us because then we'll finally get the budget we need to actually comply with the law. And that was, as a 25-year-old inspector, that was kind of eye-opening for me. But again, setting that policy, setting clear policy direction, looking at what authorities you have and expanding those authorities. For example, It's one thing to collect a penalty. It's another thing that I have enforcement staff who are in multi-year negotiations with companies who won't settle. I think we should be collecting fees from those companies, not just penalties, fees that support the state's investment of the staff working on those cases. We're also in a policy direction moving towards putting all our violators, all the violators online So people can go on our website and see which companies are in violation, have been issued an NOV. So there's an aspect of public transparency that needs to happen. There's an aspect of ensuring the state is properly compensated for our investment of time in trying to return companies to compliance. Those are some of the areas we're focused on right now in New Mexico. But again, I don't feel like I have to say to the companies in New Mexico that your investment is valued. I think they know that because we constantly remind them of it. But it's when they fall out of compliance that we want to move in swiftly, return them to compliance, but also hold them accountable for the reasons that they're out of compliance. And Doug, any comment there? You served at EPA. When a state has this kind of policy, what role, if any, does EPA have when they're trying to accomplish those objectives that Secretary Kenny laid out? My take is that largely if a state is operating in that capacity and has a partnership approach with the federal government that the overwhelming majority of the compliance work falls at the state level. And I think the goal is not enforcement for the sake of enforcement. It's to have guardrails on the environment and public health. And so if you can bring a company into compliance, and there are a lot of reasons why they might not be, and many of them involve nothing nefarious. It may be funding, it may be mistakes, it may be training those sorts of things. So I think that's a, an appropriate goal for those folks who are recalcitrant or making economic decisions not to come into compliance and to affirmatively gain a competitive advantage, then those, those entities are, are ripe for enforcement scrutiny. And that's where EPA should come in and work jointly with the state. Sometimes EPA goes it alone. Sometimes the state goes it alone. It really depends on the relationship between the state actors and the relevant federal actors. In staying in the enforcement topic, New Mexico is a major oil and gas producer. What role do you see enforcement playing, Secretary Kenny, if any, in that sector going forward? Yeah, and that's a great question. We're often in this sort of discussion around it's 30, 40 percent of our general fund in state revenues is coming from the oil and gas industry, right? So we have an approach in New Mexico that we expect that these companies will follow the law and we've just passed and have an effect state standards that even EPA has pulled aspects of to codify into their new oil and gas rules that they've put out for public comment. But look at it this way, Justin, our ozone concentrations are rising 
our number one source of emissions in those areas in which those ozone concentrations are rising are directly related to oil and gas activities. And those activities tend to mostly happen around the Delaware Basin in Southeast and the San Juan Basin in, in the Northwest. And there's immense leaks and sometimes super emitters that occur in that area. So I will never have the staff from a budget standpoint to have enough inspectors and attorneys to hold all the companies accountable who might have like leak rates or things like that. So we're using innovative approaches like working with different technology companies to not only do flyovers, but we're working with one company who can park an airship in the sky for periods of time and do some remote monitoring to look for emissions. So they literally park it, take measurements over a period of time, and then that'll help us enforce against those companies who have excess leaks. So we have to embrace innovation because people power isn't going to get us there for compliance assurance activities. But we also have to design rules that are somewhat easy to comply with as well. And if you look at the rules we put in place, it's not a whole lot of record keeping so much as it is a race towards developing innovative technologies. So let me, let me add one other piece to this. I think we're the first state in the country to embrace the use of fuel cells instead of flares as an air pollution control device. That is completely in alignment with everything that we want to see happen around investments we're pursuing under the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act. So if we can have low carbon footprint hydrocarbons in New Mexico, that's long term going to help not only our environment, but our economy as well. So there's a valuation there that is really strategic on our part in New Mexico to continue to work with the industry, but hold them accountable at the same time. That's super interesting. I'm at a point in my career where I actually spend a fair amount of time dealing with climate VCs and climate tech. And I go to Silicon Valley, which if I'd started off 25 years ago or 26 years ago, I would have never imagined. Do you ultimately think that New Mexico can play a leadership role with other states or EPA in that space? Or do you think it's more of an approach where each state has its ideas, like these fuel cells you mentioned, and then you work with entrepreneurs or venture or in the ecosystem? I'm going to boast a little bit here because you set me up nicely to do that. I think we're already there. I think we're leading the way. And I don't have to, that's just not a subjective opinion on my part. I can look at that objectively from the companies who are working with our economic development agency that I get brought in to have those conversations with. And let me just, there's a little bit of competition between states here. And let me just also say that when you codify the nation's leading oil and gas role here in New Mexico to the point that EPA and Department of Interior are calling you up saying, we want to pick your brain and kind of use the model you created to create a national standard. The one thing that I will constantly come back to is that by creating that level of certainty for industry, we're valuing their investment here in ways in which you're not seeing that happen in other states. And even if you look at the Permian Basin, which spans both New Mexico and Texas, On the Texas side, the value of the investment isn't nearly as certain because New Mexico has created that level playing field within the state. And that, to me, is the certainty that we're creating through our climate and air goals that internationally, it resonates with companies. Look at their ESG goals. And I know Doug is working on this from his retirement job that he's so good at. But that shareholders value that. Every company that we're talking to wants to be seen as, but not just greenwashed as, a leader in the climate space. And we give them that certainty by the rules that we've put in place to excel. That's super cool. It reminds me of, you know, we learned in law school, federalism is the laboratory of democracy. And you get these little beta experiments or pilot tests in each state. But Doug, as you mentioned, in his retirement has become a startup king, a VC guy. So any thoughts from your perspective, Doug, working on ESG uh, and climate tech? Yeah, a couple of thoughts. So Secretary Kenny said two words that I think are two of the leading trends, kind of the mega trends. So I'll take a step back. I think if you're looking at the environment writ large and you want to know what are the real drivers here, it's transparency, it's innovation, and it's public sentiment. Public sentiment is not going anywhere. It is accelerating in terms of the expectations of government, companies, any organization 
to operate in a sustainable fashion. And those, there's been a lot of pushback recently in the last six to eight months about the ESG and woke capitalism, hoping that ESG sentiment will die down or be regulated out is a bit in my mind like standing at the beach and ordering the tide not to come in. This is where the public is going. And so those companies and those states that understand that and are the the innovation leaders are the ones who can really excel. And that can be their differentiator. I was on the phone with a company who's moving aggressively into the climate space. And the view is an ESG focus and an innovation focus within that and one with measurement and reliability is no longer a nice to have. It's a have to have in this market. And I think is pivoting back to the enforcement side, transparency is only going to support greater enforcement and compliance work. What goes on behind the fence line less and less stays behind there. And the statements that companies are making either in their submissions to the states and EPA or even in sustainability reports with the activities of the SEC are going to be much riper for scrutiny and potential enforcement scrutiny if companies don't get it right. I was trying to steer us into carrots and you're already back in the sticks, Doug. (laughs) It's you can't can't teach an old dog new tricks. (laughs) I mean, speaking about a related topic. There's a lot of announcements coming out of the administration on environmental justice. And what does that mean to you, Secretary Kenny? And how do you implement that? Yeah, great question. And I've never seen the federal government's focus in all my years, and maybe Doug would, would agree with me on this. I've never seen such a tie together between the implementation of environmental programs and the use of environmental justice and equity. They've never been so tied together in all my years. And it's fantastic that finally we're at that point. And in a state in which we have more people of color and tribes and pueblos in this state, I think it's about time. This is a really good focus for New Mexico. So when it comes to making sure that the most vulnerable populations are the most protected populations, and that may mean from socioeconomic or race or other standards, that is exactly what we're seeing. When that translates from the top of EPA, let's say, or from the federal government, and then infuses into all the grants and programs that states have, that is one catalyst for making sure that we're implementing it with that Justice 40 perspective or whatever you want to focus in on that the feds are pushing. But on the ground, what that means is more focus on our permitting programs, more focus on our enforcement programs to make sure that we're implementing those provisions more aggressively. And that, I think, has been long overdue. I will also add that in New Mexico, prior to me coming to this position, we were cited by EPA's civil rights program for not having equal access for limited English proficiency. And in a state that is, again, predominantly Spanish speaking, to not have permitting programs that put out fact sheets or allow for interpretation or translation services is a real disservice to communities. So we've been really focused on making sure that there's equity in the process. And I think that has allowed public participation to greatly increase, even during a time when it was really hard to do that with a pandemic. But we found ways in which to do it and continue to move forward. So, yeah, we're really proud of what we're doing in New Mexico to include all voices at the table. Thanks. And you recently announced, your agency announced an environmental crimes task force. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, really excited for this announcement. And this is something that Doug and I had worked on at EPA. And I'd gone around the country in my EPA days and worked with criminal investigators and attorneys to provide them with technical support of what an environmental crimes task force could do. Like, how could we bring these cases coming into this position and not having a really cohesive or strong civil enforcement program? We've been focusing on that. And we're also now focused on building the environmental crimes task force. So We got our federal and state partners together. We kicked off the Environmental Crimes Task Force last fall. We are developing training curriculum for those investigators and attorneys who are going to investigate and prosecute these cases. And we're going to continue expanding the Environmental Crimes Task Force through other state, federal, and tribal agencies in New Mexico. 
there was sort of a unanimous discussion among those state and federal agencies and the tribes that they wanted to look at not only worker protection issues, like think of OSHA-related issues, but oil and gas issues in particular, because everything from air emission problems to migratory bird issues and wildlife issues have all been related, or they see oil and gas as a ripe area for a number of those environmental crimes. So that's one area we're going to focus on as a task force, but not exclusively. But we're excited to launch the Environmental Crimes Task Force, and we're having a retired FBI agent come on board to my department who will lead that for the state in partnership with EPA's Criminal Investigation Division out of the Dallas office. Thanks, Secretary. Doug, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's great. When I was in CID as a special agent and the director, we had tremendous relationships with a number of states, but it really depended on the state and EPA's presence and level of engagement. So I think having that collaboration is foundational to success. Overwhelmingly, the environmental protection and enforcement work, I say this as a 26-year EPA veteran, is not done by the EPA, it's done by states and local organizations. And so being tied into them is critical. The insights, the -the on-the-ground knowledge, the detailed understanding of facilities, locations, the people who operate them. So I think the most effective approach in any sort of environmental crimes task force is bring state, federal, and local resources where applicable together. And don't worry about the credit, just roll up your sleeves and work together and there can be tremendous successes. But again, there have to be willing participants at both or all three levels of government for it to be successful. And that's a really good lead into a question I had for Secretary Kenny as someone who's a longtime federal EPA official who now works at a state leads a state agency. What are some of the key differences that you didn't understand before you took this position? Yeah, it's a great question. And I say this with all due respect to my former EPA colleagues and friends, and Doug just alluded to this, that the states are the front line and we have those relationships with the communities. We have those relationships with the industry. And effectively, if you translate that into criminal work, we have the sources in the field. We have the eyes and ears that are out there. But the volume and pace of work that happens in states is unlike anyone could imagine at EPA. And I say that, again, being a former EPA person. What comes at you on an hourly basis is just intense, and there's a lot of work. So a key difference, I think, is the volume between a state and the feds. And in that case, it's also a nice luxury that the feds could maybe spend a little bit more time in developing some of these cases, right? So where we're high volume, they may be lower volume, but high impact in some of those matters. And that, that's a really good complementary relationship. I don't say that with judgment. I say that with admiration for both the state and federal dynamic. And that's the way it should be. We should be exchanging information my sort of docket of civil cases where there's a subset of them that make you scratch your head and say, hmm, but I don't have the staff from an investigatory standpoint nor a legal standpoint to dive deeper. Those are the cases we want to hand over to the feds and support them and vice versa. We want them to tell us about cases they're seeing, let's say in Texas on the Permian side, so that we have some lens into what we could be looking for in the field on the civil side. Because again, we're out there more than they are. So as long as you approach this from a complementary standpoint, as opposed to, and Doug alluded to it, that this is mine, that's theirs. As long as you're complementary, I think we're gonna see synergies that we haven't seen in New Mexico in many, many years. And we'll measure that through prosecutions. Doug, anything to add there? I think it's spot on. I'd say foundationally, it's got to be about effective relationships and putting competition aside. Sometimes there's silly competition dynamics at all levels of law enforcement, regulatory agencies. And if you put those aside and find really high quality people to work with, like I'm sure the secretary has on his team, then there are significant opportunities to be successful, which ultimately is a, translates into prosecutions, but really protecting public health and the environment, which is the ultimate goal beyond simply a the prosecutions. Thanks, Doug. And I want to finish up on just a favorite topic of mine, having served for 10 years in government and you, Secretary Kenny, are serving and Doug served for a long time, I think 26 years. There are surveys out there that say there's a declining interest in public service. And so what would you say to people who might be interested in or have never even thought of it? I think there's a lot of value for both the public sector, frankly, the private sector, but any words of wisdom, Secretary and Doug? Yeah, 
I think you're spot on, Justin, with your observation that we're seeing less people come into public service, partly because we're not modeling effective public service. I mean, I have staff that go out to public meetings and get yelled at. I have staff that go out to do inspections and get told no. I remember being a young inspector in West Virginia, going to a dry cleaner and having a shotgun pulled on me and being so naive that I thought my job was to sit there and talk to them about, why are you angry at the federal government? And <laughs> so maybe a little bit of better understanding of what my role is now. But I think what we need to do is really celebrate public servants. I think we saw during the pandemic and here in New Mexico during wildfires and the drought and the floods we had that followed, that without the public servants, the civil servants working on these topics, you really put people at risk and at disadvantage. One of the things that we're trying to avoid becoming in New Mexico is the nation's nuclear repository for spent fuel. I need engineers. I need scientists. I need those people who, without them, that could happen. That could happen if we don't have the right people working on these topics. It's an amazingly rewarding career to be a civil servant, and the responsibility that you get the minute you take your job is unlike anything else. At the end of the day, you're not working for profit, you're working for public good. And I feel like that is often lost in the discussion of why be a public servant because you're working for the greater good. And that's something that I've not lost sight on, which is why I'm here. It's a great career and we just got to keep cultivating people to take these positions and we have to support them when those challenges like I just described come up. They really do need a lot of support and they need to be paid better. Anything to add, Doug? Well said by the secretary. I would add there's no better place to learn. It may not be a career. It may be three years, five years, but the learning you get, the responsibility you can get at an early stage in your career can be priceless. And then mission, if, if mission appeals to you, and that's one of the drivers, it's a great place to find that. And you know, I founded my company, Ecolumix, which is based on the insights, some of the insights that I learned from being around incredibly smart people, like the secretary, the insights I learned. So sometimes after that experience, you can learn it and apply it in the private sector as well. Justin, can I add one last thing? Yes, absolutely. I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you and your listeners that New Mexico Environment Department has about 140 positions that are funded and we're hiring and every new employee gets five days personal time off. So maybe that's a special for your listeners, but we are offering it to everybody who comes on board. So anyway, big plug for New Mexico Environment Department. Awesome. Thank you both for joining the enforcement angle. Good to be with you both. Thank you. Same. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.